an algebraic framework for silent pre-processing with trustless setup and active security. And Damiano Abram is going to give the talk. Does it work? Okay, great. So this is the result of a collaboration between myself, uh, Ivan Demgord, Claudio Landi, and Peter Shaw, all from Aarhus University. So uh, our main contribution is the introduction of an algebraic framework that can be used to build public EPCFs for OT and vector relay and two-party homomorphic secret sharing for branching programs. In the next slides, I will recap the definition of these two primitives. So the algebraic framework can be instantiated in various ways. Uh, the first one is Palier. Actually, this is kind of uh, something already known since Euroclip 2021. Then we have a variant of Joey Libert, and finally, class groups. Uh, the first two options have a disadvantage, namely that in order to build public EPCFs and homomorphic secret sharing, we need trusted setups. But class groups don't suffer from this issue. Uh, finally, in the paper, we present uh, how to upgrade all our constructions to active security, and we obtain implementable solutions. OK, so we considered and solved two problems. Uh, in the first one, we have two parties and the correlation function c. Uh, this is just a function that outputs two random correlated values, r0 and r1, and we want to give r0 only to party p0 and r1 only to party p1. Uh, furthermore, we want to generate many of these correlated pairs uh, using only one round of interaction and sublinear communication in the number of samples we produce. A possible solution to this problem is, is called public key pseudo-random correlation function, or public key PCF for short. Basically, it is a one-round protocol in which the parties exchange some public keys, and then with the aid of public nonces, they can evaluate them and get their own share of the correlated randomness. In order to generate many shares, all they need to do is to pick many nonces, they repeat the computations many times, and they don't need to interact after the first round. Okay, uh, in the paper, we present a construction that works for OT and vector early correlation. All right, uh, the second problem we considered is again in the two-party setting, but now the parties hold some private inputs, x0 and x1. Our goal is to evaluate some function f belonging to some class capital F, and we want to, to compute the output using only two rounds of interaction plus um, PKI actually. So a possible solution to this problem is called homomorphic secret sharing, and basically, uh, it's a two-round construction in which the parties initially secret share their inputs according to some particular secret sharing scheme. And then with only local computations, they can derive an additive secret sharing of the output. So by pulling together Z0 and Z1, they get what they want. So uh, in the paper, we present a construction that works for a generalization of the class of branching programs. OK, um, our starting point is the rise of Palier. It's a Eurocrypt 2021 paper, and it solved both the problems I just described. Uh, the solution is based on the Palier crypto system, and actually it suffers some for, from some disadvantages, namely that uh, in order to build public EPCFs and homomorphic secret sharing, uh, they need trusted setups. Uh, these tr trusted setups generate a public RSA moduli uh, of unknown factorization. Okay, in this paper, we notice that the ideas of the rights of Palier can be generalized. So we don't need to work over Palier anymore. We can just work over a generic group that satisfies some particular properties. And yeah, one of the instantiations of this framework is class groups, and that allows us to get rid of trusted setups. Okay, our framework in detail is a group G that can be decomposed into the product of F and H, where F is cyclic. And we ask that D log is easy over F, but hard over H. So in this setting, we are able to solve the distributed D log problem, which is the base technique at the base of our construction. And yeah, basically we have two parties who have two values, alpha and beta, and the quotient of these two values is guaranteed to be a power of F, F to the M. Our goal is to convert this into an additive secret sharing of M without any interaction. So the parties just need to work on their inputs. They are not allowed to communicate. OK, um, in order to explain how to solve the, this problem, I have to recap the definition of coset. Basically, this is just a, a subset of the group G that is obtained by repeatedly multiplying any element G by powers of F. So if we repeat this operation for each element of the group, we end up with this kind of structure. 
So uh, the group is decomposed into cosets, and if each of these looks like a ring because f is cyclic. Now, we uh, consider again uh, the setting of the distributed D-log. We have these two elements, alpha and beta, whose quotient is f to the m. What does that mean? It means that alpha and beta both belong to the same coset. And that's because we can obtain alpha by multiplying beta by this power of f. So now let's pick this coset and we simpl simplify our setting a little bit. Uh, we assume that the parties have a public canonical representative of the coset. We denote it by gamma, and this is just an element that is known to both parties, and this element is part of the coset. Now, uh, since alpha and beta belong uh, to the coset, it means that we can walk from beta to alpha, uh, walking around, uh, along the ring, and that corresponds to multiplying by f to the m. Since gamma belongs to this coset too, it is also possible to walk from beta to gamma. And we call the corresponding power, uh, the one uh, of the walk, f to the b. In a similar way, we can walk from gamma to alpha, and we call the corresponding power f to the a. So what's the relation between a, b, and m? It must be that the sum of a and b is equal to m modulo the order of f. And this is what we want to obtain. And actually, this is already the solution. Why is this the case? Because a and b are known to p0 and p1, respectively. In order to obtain A, we just need to divide alpha by gamma. We obtain F to the A. And then we can compute the D log that is easy because it's a D log over F. In a similar way, we can obtain B by uh, dividing gamma by beta and then again computing the D log. All right. The big question is how do we get these canonical representatives in polynomial time and without any interaction? So in order to solve this problem, we introduced two new notions. And the first one is called the coset labeling function. Basically, this is just a function that runs in polynomial time and maps each of the cosets into a different element. The other notion we introduce is called the lifting function, and basically it does the opposite. It is again computable in polynomial time. It picks any element in the image of the coset labeling function and it lifts it back into an element of the corresponding coset. So how can we use this to find the canonical representatives? Well, it's pretty easy. The parties just take their input, they apply the coset labeling function, they end up with the same element, and then they lift it back into the cosent. Uh, the result is gamma, the canonical representative. And at that point, we can solve distributed D log as I described in the previous slide. All right, so there are many groups that can be decomposed into as the product of F and H, where D log is easy over F. Uh, the question is how many of these groups have coset labeling functions and lifting functions? Uh, we came up with instantiations. Uh, the first one is Palier. Um, this was already known since Euro 2021. Actually, we are just generalizing the ideas of the rise of Palier. So here, uh, the coset labeling function is just the reduction modulo n. Uh, the lifting function is the identity. Another case we can deal with is when uh, f is small, namely polynomial in size. Uh, here, the coset labeling function just outputs the minimum according to the lexicographical order in the coset. And we can compute this in polynomial time because the coset is small. And the lifting function is, again, the identity. Then we have some variants of Joey Libert. Uh, in this variance, uh, the plaintext space is uh, has size equal to the product of the first L primes for some integer L. And the techniques here are just applying the trick of the previous case when f is small with the Chinese remainder theorem. And finally, we have uh, class groups. Um, here, pi and delta are actually homomorphisms, and they are not new to cryptography. They were used, for instance, in the nice crypto system. The important point here, however, is that for Pallier and uh, Joey Libert, we still need trusted setups in order to build public EPCF and homomorphic secret sharing. But for class groups, we don't have this problem. OK. My goal now is to uh, describe one of our constructions, namely the public EPCF for vector early correlation. Uh, and I will start by recapping what vector early correlation is. So we have two parties and we work over a group ZN. In our construction, this N will be an RSA module. We want to generate random tuples of the following form. So P0 gets a random pair XZ0, uh, P1 gets a random pair Z1Y, 
And these elements need to satisfy the correlation rule you see in the middle, namely that Z1 is equal to Z0 plus the product of X and Y. In some sense, Z0 and Z1 are a subtractive secret sharing of the product X times Y. We want to generate many of these tuples and we want to reuse the same value Y, uh, the element of part P1 for each of them. And these are called the vector early tuples and they are used more or less everywhere in cryptography, especially multi-party computation. Okay, so our PCF will have the following form. So part P1 will hold the element Y, the parties exchange their public keys, and then with the help of public random nonces generated using a random oracle, uh, they can obtain their own share of the correlation. P0 gets the pair X at zero, P1 gets only uh, Z1, and the elements are guaranteed to satisfy the vector only correlation uh, at the bottom. Okay, uh, our construction can be split into two parts. The first part is a PCF that relies on a trusted dealer. And the second part is a one drum protocol that substitutes this uh, trusted dealer. The first part can be built using distributed D log over the Pallier group. And actually it is the same construction as the rise of Pallier. The second part, our contributions are all in the second part, which is actually a one round OE protocol. It can be built using distributed D-log over the generic framework. And yeah, using the class group instantiation, we don't need an interested setup. Now, my goal is to describe the first construction and later on I will describe the second one. So I will start by recapping uh, Pallier. So we have this RSA modulo N and a decryption key D, which is just an in integer that is congruent to zero modulo phi of N and congruent to one modulo N. We work over the group Zn square star, the, the invertible elements in Zn square. And this group can be decomposed as the product of the subgroup generated by one plus n and another subgroup eight. D log is easy over the first subgroup, but hard over the second one. So this already gives a hint on why this is an instantiation of our framework. Okay, so in order to encrypt a value X, we just need to raise one plus N to the X, and then we multiply by a random element R raised to the N. In order to decrypt, we just take the ciphertext, we raised it to the D, and what we get is one plus N to the X. In order to retrieve X, we just compute a D log, which is easy because it's in the first uh, subgroup. An important property that I will use in the PCF is that if we pick a random element in the group G, what we get is also a random Pallier ciphertext. Okay, uh, now I will explain the main trick in the PCF with trusted dealer. So we have this trusted dealer that generates uh, uh, the Pallier keys, N and D. Then it will provide the parties with element Y0 and Y1 that satisfy what you see in, on the slide. So uh, Y1 is equal to Y0 plus D times Y. In some sense, it's a subtractive secret sharing of the decryption key times an integer Y. This integer can be sampled at random. We also assume that we have a Pallier cipher text C, an encryption of some other value X. Okay. Now the parties can take this ciphertext and raise it to uh, Y0 and Y1. And what they get are elements alpha and beta whose quotient is guaranteed to be one plus N to the X times Y. Why is this the case? Well, we are kind of performing a di distributed decryption of the ciphertext. Um, the only difference is that everything is also raised to the Y. Anyway, the important point is that uh, these alpha and beta satisfy the condition to apply the distributed D log techniques. And so the parties uh, can non-interactively obtain elements Z0 and Z1 that satisfy the vector only correlation, namely a subtractive secret sharing of the product X times Y. So how can we use this to uh, build a PCF? Well, we have this trusted dealer. Uh, it generates the uh, uh, Pallier keys uh, and the secret sharing Y0, Y1, uh, where Y is sampled at random. Then it will give D and Y0 to part P0 and Y1 and Y to part P1. The PCF nonces uh, will be random Pallier ciphertexts and we can generate these non-interactively using a random oracle. Because as I said, uh, in order to sample a random Pallier ciphertext, we just need to pick a random element in the Pallier group, Z and square star. 
Now we have the ciphertext, we have these elements y0 and y1, we can apply the trick that I described before. So without any interaction, the parties obtained 0 and z1 that satisfy the vector only correlation. Now we also have to provide x and y to the two parties, p0 and p1. For y, we have no issues because the trusted dealer already gave the uh, to uh, here to party p1 at the beginning. Uh, for x, also we have no problems because p0 has the decryption key, so it can just decrypt the ciphertext, the one in the nonce. Okay, this was the PCF uh, based on the trusted dealer. Now I will explain uh, the one round protocol that removes this trusted dealer. So uh, we use the same technique. Uh, so we start by uh, reconsidering again what the trusted dealer does. So first of all, it generates these uh, uh, palier keys and it gives the decryption key to party P0. Here we are assuming that the parties are semi-honest, so we can just let P0 generate the keys and then it will send N to party P1 in the only round of interaction. The trusted dealer gives also Y to party uh, P1. Uh, this element is sampled at random, so we can just let P1 sample it for itself. The harder part is uh, obtaining these elements Y0 and Y1, the secret sharing of the product D times Y. Basically, we want a one-room protocol in which P0 inputs D, P1 inputs Y, and the parties obtaining obtain the secret sharing of the product uh, uh, in a secure way. So basically, it's a one-round only protocol. We use the same construction as the rise of Palier. We try to generalize it to uh, the framework, but actually things are not as easy as one might ex expect. So we rely on a CRS. This consists of two random elements in the group, G and H, and we sample them according to some distribution D. In the class group instantiation, this CRS will be generated using a random org. Okay, the methods of, of party P0 will be a group element V, that is equal to g to the r times h to the d for some uh, random element r. The methods of party p1 will be an Elgamal-like encryption of its input y, and the corresponding public key will be the one in the CRS, the pair g8. Uh, using only local computations, the parties are able to derive elements alpha and beta, whose quotient is f to the y times d. So again, using the distributed delog techniques, we can uh, convert everything into a secret sharing of the product D times Y. This is exactly what we want, and we never uh, had to interact after the first round. This is enough for correctness. The question is security. So uh, we want to preserve the privacy of the inputs, D and Y. So one could argue that the method of Methods of party P0 leaks no information about D because everything is masked by this random power G to the R. Whereas the method of party P1 leaks no information about Y uh, because it's an Elgamal like ciphertext. So under DD8, there should be no problems. This is true, but only if H is a random power of G. And here there are problems because class groups are not cyclic. So if we pick a random element H, this most likely isn't a power of G. One could argue that it, this is no problem as long as the, pair, the original pair G8 looks like a pair in which H is around the power of G, but this argument fails if a trustless, a trustless setup. Why is this the case? Well, uh, if we use a random oracle to produce the CRS, we also to provide the random coins that are used to uh, provide to generate G and H. This will be the output of the random oracle. And yeah, in class groups, there are no distribution D that are invertible in polynomial time. So if we pick H to be a random power of G, we are not able to simulate the random coins that generated it. Okay, the solution to this problem is a new assumption. Uh, we call it the XD8, and it stands for decisional cross group D uh, Basically, it says that this DD8 like tuple G8, G to the R, H to the R, plus the random coins used to generate G and H, looks like a tuple of the same form in which we substitute g to the r with a random power of h, h to the s. This assumption is sufficient to prove the security of this construction. And yeah, we believe that it can be useful for other applications on class groups. For instance, it can be used to prove the security of Pedersen commitments that don't need a trusted setup. So there were other paper that claimed already this, but their uh, proofs were wrong because they never considered the fact that D is not invertible. 
the distribution used to generate GNAs. Okay, this is the end of my presentation. Here, there is a slide with a recap of the results. And yeah, if there are questions, I'm happy to answer. We have a couple minutes for questions. Yes, please use the microphone. Hmm. First of all, thank you very much for the talk. I really enjoyed it. It was uh, beautiful, I think. I, I wanted to ask you, uh, based your construction on groups that you can factor to two uh, components that in which in one of which discrete log is easy and in the other one uh, it's hard. It's hard. Uh, I wanted to ask if you can, uh, I see that you understand that you instantiate it with uh, uh, class groups. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any other known uh, techniques to do it uh, specific, specifically um, uh, post quantum safe uh, groups? Uh, no, I would say uh, no i i don't really i'm not really an expert in post quantum but i would say that no uh the issue is that usually these kind of techniques are based on dd log the dd8 the hardness of i mean that's not possible in in a post quantum setting okay, thank you so yeah more questions uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. Mm -hmm. I want to ask if you have you tried at all to break DXDH? Do you have uh, intuition for why it should yeah. be true? So uh, basically, uh, we discussed this also with uh, Castaños and uh, Laguillami that are expert in class groups. So all the uh, natural attacks fail. And it seems that in order to break the assumption, we have to come up with some new attack that potentially can compromise the other assumption on class groups, for instance, the fact that it's hard to find the order of the class group itself. Mm. Okay, right. thank you. <laughs> More questions? Okay, I have a question. Mm. Uh, so can you tell us what kind of modulus can you handle? What type of modulus can you handle? Like the N in the vector Oli correlation? Or what? Yeah, the Oli Yeah, that's an RSA module. It's the one of the Pallier construction. So for all of them, when you use the class groups, what would be the model? Uh, for class groups, okay, uh, it's different. But uh, class groups are used only in the uh, one round Oli. Uh, there, the modulo can be any prime. I see. Yeah. Okay, so if there's no more questions let's thank the speaker again and yep. uh, we'll let the second speaker set up and we are actually ahead of time so we'll wait for two minutes so that people who want to see the next talk can come in Let's start. Our second talk is a quadratic multi-party randomized encodings beyond the honest majority and their applications. And our Carney is going to be the speaker. So uh, first, thank you guys for, guys for sticking so late at the conference. Um, my talk is about quadratic multi-party randomized encodings that go beyond the honest majority privacy threshold and some of their applications. This is based on a joint work with Benny Applebaum, Yuval Ishai, and Rapita Patel. So in today's talk, first I'll give some brief background and motivation for a problem that MPREs can help us solve. Then I'll introduce our main model, the 2MPRE, and show our results. After this, I will go over some applications to MPREs and one potential approach to improve our results. Then a brief overview of the proof of the main theorem and conclude with that. So MPC, there's been lots of MPC in this conference. I assume you're all familiar, but let's have a brief overview. Um, in MPC, we have several parties, each one with its own private input. And their goal is to somehow compute the functionality of their input. And the functionality is just like a function, but the outputs are distributed between the parties. So for example, here we can say, Y1 goes to the yellow party, Y2 goes to the orange party, so on and so forth. And of course, that we should do it privately without leaking information about the private input. The way it's usually done is with protocols where the parties communicate over a number of rounds and then receive the output of the functionality. 
And privacy here means that every coalition of key parties learns nothing beyond the output of the functionality. So for example, if you look at the coalition of the red and green party, want its view in the protocol to be stimulated by its inputs and outputs of the functionality. Now, there are many notions of stimulation and adversaries, so let us define our narrow focus. Uh, our adversaries are passive or semi-honest, which means they cannot deviate from the protocol, and they are computationally unbounded. So we are in information-theoretic crypto, not computational crypto. We also require perfect simulation, even though it's not strictly necessary for most of our construction. All right, so first let's begin with some motivation, the client-server model. In the client-server model, the parties are divided into two groups, clients and servers. Clients hold the inputs and receive the outputs of the functionality, while servers have no inputs and outputs, they are just there to assist the clients in the computation. And the interaction pattern is fairly trivial, sort of looks like a distributed FEG. There are two rounds. In the first round, the client sends a message to the servers, which then do some local operation on the, on the inputs and return a result to the clients in the second round. Based on this, the clients can compute the functionalities out. Uh, so Barcol et al. stated the question of can we achieve protocols in this model that are private with an honest majority of the servers and some arbitrary set of the clients. And why is this distinction between servers and clients? Well, because servers are usually more stable and fixed entities and behind them stand large companies like Google or Amazon. So they can be more carefully monitored and audited and making honesty assumptions in them sort of makes sense. But clients, clients come and go and an adversary could easily flood the system with hundreds of corrupt clients so we must protect ourselves against as many uh, corrupt clients as possible. What is known? So Applebaum et al. showed that every functionality has a protocol in the client server model that is private with an honest majority of the clients and an honest majority of the servers. But there is still an open question of can we achieve a protocol that's private with a dishonest majority of the clients and an honest majority of the servers. And this question is open even in the simplest setting of three clients, three servers. There is only, only one known solution that's both computationally secure, not information theoretic, and it makes a non black box use of a viewer's transfer, transfer. So it's highly impractical. So this, uh, this is one of our motivating questions in, in uh, exploring two MPREs. So, what are two MPREs? This model of computation has been, was introduced by Applebaum et al. And here, the parties, we have the parties, if each one has its own private input. And at first, each party does some local computation based on its input and its randomness. Then comes the only interactive uh, step of the protocol, where the par parties jointly compute some degree two functionality. By degree two, I mean algebra algebraic degree two, so like x squared or x times y. And by jointly compute, I mean they have black box access to the ideal functionality. So intuitively, you can think about it like a trusted party, that all the parties send their uh, results to the trusted party, and, and then this trusted party distributes some degree to functionality between the parties. Then follows some more local computation, and the parties compute the output of the functionality. So this can be viewed as sort of a non-interactive reduction from a general functionality to a degree two functionality. This reduction is highly beneficial because usually in MPC, the algebraic degree of the functionality is a critical factor when implementing it. So two MPRE is very good for models with low interaction. For example, Apple Mamet al showed that given a T private two MPRE, we can compile it to a client server protocol that is private against an honest majority of the servers and up to T corrupt clients. So all we need is just two MPREs with high privacy threshold. What do we have? Apple Bam et al. showed how to take a protocol in the plane model and compile it to a 2MPRE. So this immediately gives us a 2MPRE for every functionality that is private with an honest majority of the party. And all following constructions of 2MPRE are also restricted to this honest majority setting because they are either explicitly or implicitly based on plane model MPC. So this is a, leads us to our main question of, can we construct two MPREs that go beyond this honest majority privacy threshold? And as it turns out, the answer is positive. We have constructed in our main theorem, the first two MPRE that goes beyond this bound with the privacy thresholds of two thirds round down. 
And we've also shown that this, any tiny improvement to this town is critical, meaning that if I had a true MPRE with a privacy threshold of two thirds round up, I could, could, could construct from it a true MPRE with full privacy. So two thirds round down is sort of a logical stopping point between honest majority and full privacy. As an immediate corollary, we got a perfectly fully private true MPRE in the three party setting, since two thirds of three party gives us full privacy. And we have also shown equivalence between two MPREs and other models of computation, which gives us new results in, in new models. The one immediate application of the main theorem that we can get is um, a fully private client server protocol. Since we have a fully private three party two MPRE, as we, as we saw, we can compile it to a client server protocol with full privacy against three clients and three servers. So this solves our motivating question. Let's go on, on some other applications of, uh, of two MPREs. For this, we need to remind ourselves of the, of the IT, OT hybrid model. In this model, the parties have black box, access, black box access to the oblivious transfer functionality. Let us remind ourselves what it is. The OT functionality is a two-party functionality where Alice holds a pair of messages and Bob holds a single bit. And Bob receives the selected message. So Alice does not know which message Bob selected, and Bob does not know what was the other message that he did not select. And computations in these protocols look like this. Uh, the parties have their own private inputs, they do some local computation, and then a round of many, many calls in parallel to the oblivious transfer functionality. Then local computation, another round of OT calls, so on, so on and so forth, until we get the output of the functionality. And it is known that this model is strong. By, the, uh, by this, I mean that every functionality has the protocol in the OT hybrid model with full privacy. So OT is actually complete for secure multi-party computing. However, in MPC, we usually want to restrict the interaction between the parties. So we ask ourselves, what happens if you consider only a single round of calls to OT? Well, in this case, Yao has shown uh, that for two parties, this, enough, this is enough. You can implement any two parties using an information theoretic garbage circuit with a single round of calls to OT. So OT is actually non-interactively complete for 2PC. Unfortunately, it has been shown by Apple et al that for more than two, than two parties, this is not the case. OT is actually not enough. A single round of OT is not enough. So what can we hope for? What is, what is the next best protocol that we can hope for? Well, there are two options. We can either use some stronger or fancier primitive than OT, for example, a, party, a functionality that has more parties than two, or we can relax our non-interactivity requirement and add some more rounds of communication to the protocol. Let us explore these two options. So on the top, we see the first option and we ask ourselves, what happens if you replace OT by the, some three-party functionality? Can we implement any general functionality with a single round of calls to three-party functionality? As a side note, if you go one step further to four-party functionalities, this answer is positive. They are indeed enough. So, but the three-party three question is still open. And on the bottom, we explore the second option and we ask what happens if we um, consider protocols with a single round of calls to OT followed by a single round of plain model communication. We can slightly rephrase the, this question and ask, can we get a three-round protocol given two-round ideal OT? By ideal OT, I mean, um, I don't care how the OT is implemented can be implemented with a trusted party, with the protocol, even by physical mean. I just want the ideal OT functionality. And two rounds because any realizations of OT take, it takes at least two rounds to send and receive the data, even physical realization. But why is this distinction of ideal OT important and not a protocol or something like this? Well, because for example, Patra et al already sort of answered this question. They constructed the three round protocol, but it's both computationally secure, not information theoretic, and it relies on the existence of a two round OT protocol, not an ideal OT. So if, for example, I had an OT with a trusted party, this construction does not work. All of these questions are open in the dishonest majority setting. And we have shown equivalences from two MPRE to all of these models. And by equivalence, I mean a privacy preserving reduction in both directions. So for example, given a T private two MPRE, I can get a T private uh, protocol that has a single round of calls to the grid to a three party functionality. So together with our uh, main model, main theorem, 
we get new results in all of these models for the new privacy threshold of two thirds. Let us go on to view an, a new approach to construct better of two MPREs beyond this two thirds um, threshold. For this, we need to consider active security. So we ask ourselves, what happens if we let the adversary deviate from the protocol? Kilian uh, and later improved by Ishai et al. show that every functionality can be implemented by a protocol in this model that has statistical active security with the full privacy threshold. But these protocols have some negligible correctness and privacy errors. And it was later shown that these errors are inherent. You can't hope for a protocol that has both perfect correctness and perfect privacy. But we ask, can we achieve just one of these things? Can we get a protocol that has perfect activity privacy while allowing some statistical passive correctness error? And this question is also open in the honest, in the dishonest majority set. We have shown a quite surprising connection between these two models and surprising because they are two very different creatures. On the left, we have a non-interactive, passively secure model. And on the right, we have a very interactive, actively secure model. And somehow they are equivalent. Um, and this gives us a potential new approach to construct two MPREs if you can construct uh, protocols in this new weak active uh, attacks. And by weak, we, we restrict the power of the active adversary. Uh, but it's technical detail, which you will see in the paper. Finally, let us have uh, an overview of the proof of the main theorem. The proof is made of two steps. In the first step, we take a 2MPRE, and we show that allowing the parties to have some conversation in the play model before the degree to functionality does not add any strength to the model. In other words, we show how to take uh, a protocol in this new plane and quadratic model. For this, I mean, they have a plane model conversation and then a degree to functionality. And we compile such a protocol into a 2MPRE. So we remove the plane model conversation. And in the second step, of course, we design a protocol in this new plane and quadratic model with the desired privacy threshold of two thirds. Um, I will now show in, in sort of more detail only the second step because it's more, more, more fun one to be honest. Um, so we will design such a protocol now. By the works of Ishai, Kushilavitz, and Applebaum, we know that it suffices to handle only degree three functionality. We can use them to compute any, any functionality. So we consider the following functionality, which receives three, three inputs from some three parties and delivers their product to some other party. And for the sake of this presentation, let us consider only four parties. So this is a four party functionality. So our protocol will look something like this. We have four parties, three of them hold the inputs. And then we will have a single round of plane model communication, some degree to functionality. And in the end, the green party will receive the products of those inputs. So this is our goal to design such a protocol with the desired privacy threshold. And our desired privacy threshold is T equals two. So we allow two out of four corrupt parties. Um, okay, so like many other protocols of the same type, we utilize our first round of play model communication to distribute shares of the input. And our secret sharing scheme of, of, of choice is CNF secret sharing. In CNF secret sharing, we generate a share for every potential adversarial coalition, which means in this case, since T equals two, we generate a share for every pair of parties and send this share to all other parties outside this pair. So for example, uh, if you look at the shares of X and what X and what the red party sends to the yellow party, we look at all the shares and remove the shares of pairs that contain the yellow party and give it to the yellow party. Of course, we do the same for all other parties. And this guarantees us privacy because every pair of parties does not know the share that represents it. So it cannot reconstruct the, the secret. We do this for all other inputs. And now, the product of the inputs when we expand the share becomes a sum of products of shares. And our new goal is to compute this uh, sum of degree three monomials using a degree two functionality. Seemingly impossible, but it can be done using the following key observation that every one of these degree three monomials is covered by two parties. And by this, I mean that at least one of the parties hold at least, holds at least two of the shares, each monomial. 
So for example, uh, in the middle monomial, we can see that the red party holds the shares of X and Y, while the brown party holds the share of Z. And it is not difficult to see that this is indeed the case for all other monomials. Since we know each variable, each share is held by two parties, the two parties outside the pair. And if we suppose that there is such an uncovered degree three monomial, we have three variables. Each one is held by supposedly two unique parties without overlap. So we get in total six unique parties. But this is a four party functionality, there are no parties. So there is, there is always some overlap. Always some party holds two of the shares. And since it holds two of the shares, it can just multiply them locally. Just save one multiplication. And we only use the degree two functionality to multiply those intermediate values and compute the degree, th the, the degree three monomials with the degree two functionality. Of course, we do the same for all other monomials and in this way deliver the product of the inputs to the green party. So a quick recap of the protocol, we utilize, we have a, a degree three fu function that we wish to compute with a degree two functionality. So we use a first round of plain model communication in order to distribute shares of the inputs in such a way that there is always an overlap in the monomials. And then we use this overlap to compute the degree three function with the degree two functionality. Now let us get some perspective of our information theoretic playing field. Um, on the left, we have protocols in the plane model, which are restricted to the honest majority set. And on the right, we have protocols in the OT hybrid model, which have full privacy. We've just shown that 2MPRE lies somewhere in the middle between those two models. But well, we can actually massage this picture a bit to gain a better of intuition, a better intuition of what's going on here. Uh, we can take protocols on the right and transform them in this form using, for example, Beaver triplet. So uh, on the first round, we use a degree two functionality to generate lots of correlated randomness. And then we just run the original OT hybrid protocol. Every time we want to do an OT, we just consume some correlated run. And we show that for two MPRs, we can allow a plain model conversation to happen before the degree to functionality. So we can see that all of these protocols are very, very similar to, to each other. We just take a degree to functionality somewhere along the way. And we don't know whether the location of the degree to functionality, if it's the beginning of the end, determines the strength of the protocol. No problem. Finally, let us conclude uh, with a recap of everything that we've done here. We've shown um, a connection between 2MPRE and the client server protocols, which gave us a full resolution in the three client setting. We also showed some connections between 2MPRE on all of, and all of those slightly non, almost non-interactive models um, that gave us new results with a pri new privacy threshold in all of these models. And we have also shown some potential new approach to construct better 2MPREs from weekly active uh, protocols. And we still have two open questions remaining. Uh, first of all, of course, can we construct 2MPREs with full privacy, or is this threshold actually an upper or lower bound of 2MPREs? And we still, there's still one arrow missing from this picture. We don't know whether client server protocols imply 2MPREs. So this could potentially give us uh, another approach to construct to MPA. And that is all. Thank you. We have time for questions. I uh, thanks for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I want to ask, so just like a small clarifying question. So when you say uh, T equals N, does, uh, does that mean that like there's a coalition of uh, like N minus one parties or maybe I, maybe I don't understand that? Uh, no, so it's, it's, it's for ease of use, but yeah, it's all, by, all, all but one, but you can say that if all parties are, are corrupt then your protocol is secure by definition. There's no mm. honest okay, so, I see. Thank you. More questions? Okay, so like just a quick question that uh, in the client server model that you have number of corruption for the server and then you have number of corruption for the client. And uh, when you're talking about the MPRE, like how does the, uh, 
threshold for corruption from PRE so directly translates to the client yeah. number of corruptions. I see. And what would happen if uh, you're in the slightly weaker model where the client and server are just the same? For the client, what those? Yeah. Uh, what would happen like uh, if you're in the slightly simpler model where we just have the same, like client server are the same, just n party and MPC? On oh, those servers. Then, uh, then uh, basically, in some sense, uh, things do not apply here because you restrict the server corruption to be uh, honest majority. Yeah, you, I mean, you have to have the servers in order to allow the lay model communication to give you better than honest majority. If you don't have any servers and you are basically in a plain model and then you have only honest majority for this. Okay. Okay. If no more questions, then um, we're going to ask the last speaker to get ready. And is tight bounds on the randomness complexity of secure multi-party computation. And Ifan uh, is the speaker and we will um, play the video that he has pre-prepared. And afterwards we'll ask the co-authors questions. Yovan and uh, Vipo are here. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Fan Sang. Today, I'm happy to introduce our work, Tight Bounds on the Randomness Complexity of Secure Multi-Party Computation. This is the joint work with Weibo Goya and Yuval Yishai. In this work, we are interested in the randomness complexity. We motivate this direction from two aspects. From a practical perspective, generating high-quality randomness from physical sources is difficult. Therefore, in general, we would like to reduce the randomness required in either an algorithm or a protocol as much as possible. From the theoretical perspective, the study of randomness complexity has led to important developments in computer science, such as pseudo randomness, randomness extraction, and so on. In this work, we consider the randomness complexity of secure multi party computation. Multi party computation is a protocol that allows several parties to jointly compute a common function on their private inputs. We start with the simplest setting of MPC, that is perfect and semi security against p cropping parties and computing the actual function. Later, I will mention extensions for other functions and MPC models. The randomness complexity of an MPC protocol is measured by the number of random coins tossed by all parties during the protocol execution. We allow parties to toss different number of random coins in different executions, which may depend on their own inputs and messages received from other parties. Therefore, the randomness complexity refers to the maximum number of random coins tossed in an execution for all possible inputs. We would like to remark that allowing different number of, allowing different number of coin tosses in each execution makes our lower bound results stronger. In our positive results, all coins can be tossed before the protocol begins. The problem of randomness complexity of MPC has been studied by a fairly large body of works, which covers the directions of both lower bound and upper bound. Almost all of these works consider the same simple model as we do. Our research question is to understand how the randomness complexity for computing an XOR grows with the number of private parties. Before introducing our results, I would like to review what we know from previous works. The textbook protocol for computing XOR from Ben 86 and CK93 requires out of n times t random bits. Then in KM97, Kushi Levitt and Mansour constructed a protocol with randomness complexity out of t squared times log n over t. In particular, it is the best known result for the upper bound. On the other hand, they also gave a lower bound of omega t random bits. In BDPV99, the authors obtained a lower bound of omega t squared over n minus t random bits. Then in GR05, the authors showed a lower bound of omega log n random bits for t that is larger than one. So what is implied from the previous results? First of all, when t is a constant, 
the upper bound from KM97 matches the lower bound from GR05. On the other hand, when t is very close to n, say t is equal to n minus the constant, then the upper bound from KM97 matches the lower bound from BDPV99. However, for general t, even if t is equal to n half, there is still a quadratic gap between the known upper bound and lower bound. In this work, we prove that computing XR requires at least omega t squared random bits. Our lower bound matches the upper bound from KM97 up to a logarithmic factor. In particular, it is tight when t is out of n. We extend our results and show the same lower bound applies for arbitrary symmetric Boolean functions, such as the end function and the majority function. Our second result constructs an explicit protocol for XR with order of t squared times log squared and random bits. We would like to remark that the construction in KM97 relies on an explicit combinatorial object. Our upper bound matches our lower bound up to a polylogarithmic factor. And we also extend our result to arbitrary symmetric Boolean functions with out of t squared times log cube and random bits. Interestingly, when executing t XR functions in parallel, we show how to modify our protocol such that the total number of random bits is still tailed of out of t square. Here, the tailed of big O notation omits the polylogarithmic factors. It means that the amortized cost per execution is reduced to tailed of out of t random bits. Finally, our third result gives an explicit protocol for general circuits with helper parties, which uses out of t square times log c random bits. Here, see the circuit size. And the notion of helper parties means that they do not have inputs but participate in the computation. You may view the helper parties as servers that conduct the computation. Again, this upper bound matches our lower bound up to a polylogarithmic factor. Here is an outline of my talk. I will first introduce our techniques for proving the lower bound of computing the XR function. Our idea is to establish a connection to T private encoding, which we will elaborate in the following. Recall that we focus on the perfect security with T private parties. Each party holds an input bit, and the functionality is to compute the XR of all input bits. We first lower bound the number of possible views of all parties. Then, by the lemma shown in KR98 and the GR05, the randomness complexity is lower bounded by the log of the number of possible views. To this end, we first establish a connection between views and the T private encodings. Concretely, we prove the following two claims. The messages exchanged with some party PI together with the function output encode PS input XI. And the obtained encoding scheme is T private. Here, T privacy means that any T bits of a code word should reveal no information about the secret. Then we prove that any T private encoding scheme has code word space at least omega two to the power of T. It implies that the number of possible views of PI is at least omega two to the power of T. So far, the result we obtain only yields a lower bound of omega T random bits. To obtain the desired result, we count the joint views of the first T parties. As we will show later, this allows us to improve the lower bound from omega t to omega t square. I will first show you the connection between parties' views and the encoding scheme. We focus on the first party P1, for example. We claim that the messages exchanged with P1 together with the function output should determine the input x1. Suppose the statement is false, then there should exist two different executions such that they have the same messages exchanged with P1 and the same function output, but different P1's input. Our idea is to construct a new execution to break the correctness of the underlying protocol. Consider a new execution with input tailed x and random tape tailed r. Tailed x and tailed r are identical to x and r, except that 
the input and random tape of the first party are replaced by X1 prime and R1 prime. Now we have three executions. Recall that by assumption, the first execution and the third execution have the same messages exchanged with P1 and function outputs. Since we compute the actual function, and since tells x and x only differ in the first party's input, the output of execution 2 is different from that of execution 1. Our goal is to show that the messages exchanged with P1 in all three executions are identical. Then for parties P2 to Pn, they cannot distinguish execution 1 and execution 2, which means that they would always output the same results in both executions. It would, lead to, it would lead to a contradiction with the fact that fx is not equal to f tilde of x. To this end, consider the following two facts. When we focus on the first executions, note that p2 to pn use the same inputs and random tapes in these two executions. Now it's p2 to pn, always receive the same messages from P1 in these two executions, then they cannot distinguish these two executions, and we will always send the same messages to P1 as well. Similarly, when we only focus on execution 2 and execution 3, the party P1 uses the same input and random tape. Now, if P1 always receives the same messages from other parties in these two executions, then he will always send the same messages to other parties as well. Combining these two facts and by induction, we can prove that the messages exchanged with P1 are identical in all three executions. As we have just argued, P2 to Pn would get the same output in all three executions. However, it contradicts with the fact that fx is not equal to f tilde of x. Therefore, such three executions do not exist and the statement holds. Now we can view the messages exchanged with P1 together with the function output as an encoding of P1's input. The next step is to show that the obtained encoding scheme is T private. Concretely, we want to show that any T bits of a code word should be independent of the secret. To this end, we may list all the messages that P1 sends and receives with the corresponding receivers and senders. In this example, the first message is sent to P2, the second message is received from P2, the third message is rece received from P3, and so on. Consider any T bits in the message list of P1, say M2, M4, and M7. The corresponding receivers or senders are P2, P3, and P6. Since the underlying protocol is perfectly secure against T corrupted parties, corrupting parties P2, P3, and P6 should give no information about P1's input to the adversary. In other words, any T messages are independent of P1's input. Therefore, we conclude that the messages exchanged with PI together with the function output encode PI's input XI and the obtained encoding scheme is T private. Next, we will analyze the code word space of a T private encoding scheme. Concretely, we will show that the code word space is at least omega 2 to the power of T. This implies that the number of possible views of each party PI is at least omega 2 to the power of T. This claim follows from a very simple induction. We first list all code words of zero in a table. Each column corresponds to a possible code word, and the S row corresponds to the S bits of all code words. Our goal is to count the number of columns in this table. Now we consider all code words with their first bits to be zero. We may show that given the first bit to be zero, the encoding scheme is T minus one private. Intuitively, since the original encoding scheme is T private, any T minus one bits together with the first bit should reveal no information about the secret. Therefore, when we fix the first bit to be zero, the encoding scheme becomes T minus one private. Similarly, the encoding scheme given the first bit to be one is also T minus one private. By a simple induction, we can show that 
the cold war space is at least omega to the power of t. Combining the first two steps, we obtain that each party has omega to the power of t possible views. According to KR98 and TR05, it means that we need at least t random bits. So far, we only consider the view of a single party. To obtain the desired result, in the last step, we try to lower bound the number of possible joint views of the first t parties. Let us first fix the view of the first party and consider the view of the second party. Following from the same argument, we can show that the messages exchanged with P2 together with the function output encode the input of P2. Now, the obtaining encoding scheme is T minus one private. This is because we have fixed the view of P1. Since the protocol is perfectly secure against T cropped parties, cropping any other T minus one parties together with P1 should give no information about P2's input. Our lower bound for encoding scheme shows that the code word space of the T minus one private encoding scheme is offset at least omega two to the power of T minus one. In summary, given P1's view, P2 has at least two to the power of T minus one possible views. Now we apply the same analysis for the first T parties. The number of possible joint views of the first T parties is equal to two to the power of omega T squared. When applying the techniques in KR98 and the GR05, we obtain a lower bound of omega t square random bits. Regarding the extension to any arbitrary symmetric Boolean function, please refer to our paper for more discussion. In the next part, I will briefly talk about our explicit construction. We start with a basic construction for computing XOR with the help of correlated randomness. Concretely, each party PI has input XI and the correlated randomness RI, which satisfies that the parity of all Ri is equal to zero. In the first round, each party locally computes Gi, which is equal to Xi XR with Ri. Since the summation of all Ri is equal to zero, the function output is equal to the summation of all Gi. Then we let each party conduct one additional operation, and the last party who computes the function output distributes the result to all other parties. Note that if the correlated randomness is uniform with parity zero, then the protocol is secure. This is because after masking their input bits by R, G1 to G4 are uniformly random subject to the parity to be the function output. However, generating such correlated randomness would require out of n random bits. To de-randomize the correlated randomness, KM97 and the GIS22 Consider a sufficient condition of R, which requires that any T copy parties should not be able to distinguish R from uniform distribution with parity zero. Note that if we send all GI to a single party, then there is no room to de-randomize the correlated randomness. In the basic construction, each party only computes a single addition operation. The joint views of any T copy parties is of size out of T which makes the de-randomization possible. So work KM97 identifies a distribution of the correlated randomness which satisfies the sufficient condition. The sampling space is linear and has sets out of 2 to the power of t times log n over t. Therefore, we need t times log n over t random bits to sample from this space. To instantiate such correlated randomness, each of the first t plus 1 parties samples one copy from this space. Since the sampling space is linear, all parties take the summation of all copies as the final correlated randomness. Therefore, the randomness complexity is out of t squared times log n over t. Very informally, our main contribution is an explicit construction for such a sampling space at the cost of exploding the size of the sampling space by another log n factor. Therefore, our explicit construction has the randomness complexity out of t squared times log squared and random bits. Please refer to our paper for more details about our construction. I want to briefly discuss our construction for arbitrary symmetric Boolean function. 
By definition, the output of a symmetric Boolean function only depends on the number of ones in the input bits. Therefore, there exists a function g such that fx is equal to g inputting the weight of x. Our first step is to extend our XOR protocol to compute addition over finite fields. By using a prime field of that order of n, we can compute the weight of input bits. We show how to use our addition protocol over finite fields to compute a degree t semi sharing of the weight of x. Note that the function g can be expressed as the polynomial of degree order of n over the prime field. We show that computing g can be done by a circuit of depth order of log n. In particular, the circuit contains two parts. The first part contains order of log n modifications, and the second part is an addition of several order of log n term modifications. Here is an example when log n is 3. We want to compute the summation of ai times bi times ci. We apply the BGW protocol with corruption threshold t smaller than n over log n to compute such circuits. With more details, for the first part, we use the modification protocol to compute the order of log n modification gates such that the results are shared by degree t semi sharing. For the second part, given t is upper bounded by n over log n, we show that all parties can locally compute the second part relying on the properties of the Shamir CP sharing scheme. The randomness complexity of our construction is dominated by the addition protocol or finite field. Please refer to our paper for more details. In summary, we achieved the following two main results in our paper. The first one is the lower bound of omega t square random bits for computing XOR and arbitrary symmetric Boolean functions. And the second one is an explicit upper bound for tails of all of t square random bits for computing XOR and arbitrary symmetric Boolean functions. Here is a quick review of our main techniques. For the lower bounds, we first connect each party's view to a T private encoding scheme. We also give a lower bound of the code word space of any T private encoding scheme. These two together give a lower bound of the number of views of a single party. To obtain a stronger result, we consider the number of possible joint views. Finally, by applying the techniques in KR98 and GR05, we obtain a lower bound of omega t square random bits. As for the upper bound, very informally, we give an explicit construction for the combinatorial object in KM97. Together with the basic construction via correlated randomness, we obtain an explicit XOR protocol. To extend our result to any arbitrary symmetric Boolean function, we first extend our XOR function, we first extend our XOR protocol to addition over fields. Together with the BGW protocol, we obtain an explicit protocol for symmetric Boolean functions. Please refer to our paper for more details. Before finishing my talk, I would like to discuss some open questions we leave for future work. The first question is about the trade-off between randomness complexity and statistical error. In our work, we only consider the setting of perfect security. In particular, our lower bound no longer holds without perfect security. On the other hand, we give an example protocol that achieves out of n times sigma random bits, where sigma is the security parameter. Note that this is less than t square when t is close to n. Therefore, an interesting direction would be exploring the tight lower bound and upper bound in this setting. The second question is to consider the random complexity for maliciously secure MPC. And the last question is about the lower bound of the entropy of the random complexity. In our work, we measure the random complexity by counting the number of random coins. A more liberal model is that each party may pick randomness from an arbitrary probability distribution and the goal is to minimize the entropy of this distribution. An interesting question is whether our lower bound applies to the entropy of randomness. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Yes, can you come to the 
microphone and can one of the author also come to the microphone to answer? Yeah, please go ahead with the question. Yeah, so I am just, I'm just wondering that uh, like uh, randomness complexity is typically a solid topic in theoretical a say pseudo randomness, but uh, in crypto we typical care less care, care less about uh, the number of random bits we use the, in our protocol, right? So do you have uh, more motivation for this uh, study? So there's been actually an active line of work in the practical chess community uh, in minimizing randomness complexity private circuits, which is a version of secure multi-party computation. And the motivation there is that uh, uh, the pseudo-randomness that is typically considered cheap, cheap in standard cryptographic context is expensive when you consider a uh, hardware design. So uh, there is some motivation uh, when you look at the low end of randomness complexity to minimize it uh, for very practical purposes, but our work is mainly theory driven. Sounds good, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so then let's thank all the speakers in this section and thank the authors for answering the question. And this is officially the end of uh, this amazing crypto. Let me just comment that we're still looking for good ways to run hybrid conferences. So if you have any observations about things that did or didn't work, we'd like to hear them. Send them to virtual-conferences at IACR.org.